Welcome back. Um, so we're going to take a little pause from the Model A engine for now. Um, this engine is uh, that far away from completion. Actually, all I'm waiting for in reality is the fuel separator and filter assembly for the, uh, for the fuel tank. I'm going to be mounting the fuel tank. We'll put a little bit of liquid dinosaurs in there and see, uh, see what's going to happen. Um, it will run, albeit briefly, on uh, whatever is in the float bowl. So, we're getting there. I might take this carburetor back apart though and, and maybe do a slightly better job cleaning it because, I mean, come on. It's, uh, I, I didn't do a great job with that. But, hey, we're gonna take a little little breather from that motor. I wanted, I wanna see. This engine here, this was in a video that I made a little while ago. Uh, well, actually, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is a 5S uh, that I got just handed to me. Um, I, I, these things come to me sometimes. Uh, this 5S, I thought it was a WI. Turns out it's a 5S, uh, thanks to an astute viewer. Um, so this is not a bastard of an engine. This is actually a, com a relatively complete motor. It's missing the fuel tank, which I will be able to get pretty easily. Turns out it uses a very common style fuel tank for a Briggs motor. Um, it's missing the fuel tank, but it has the oil bath air cleaner, which is nice. And um, yeah, otherwise it's complete. It's, it's all here. Um, <clears throat> this engine might have been fitted with either an idler pulley or a Kickstarter, which is why this post is here. But we're just going to remove the post. Um, I mean, it doesn't need to be there. Um, to make it more of a complete motor, we have to remove this so that it doesn't look like it's missing parts. It's fuzzy logic. Okay. Now, what I want to do, the problem with this engine is it doesn't get any compression, like at all. And there's a suction effect from the, I think it was the exhaust, which should not be. You should not be able to crank this engine over and feel air being sucked through the exhaust, which indicates um, possible uh, valve issues. So what I'm thinking, I've, uh, we've removed the valve, the valve spring cover, the, the push rod cover, and uh, determined the following. Uh, the valves are moving up and down as they should. And that's what we determined. So the valves are not, the springs aren't broken, the, the, valves are, the valves are moving up and down smoothly. There's really nothing obvious going on there. So why don't we just pop this little head off, see what the hell's going on. So here's what I'm thinking. Before we crack the head off, I'm thinking excessive carbon buildup, possibly. Uh, we could have, um, you know, we really don't know. We don't know the history of this motor. What we do know is that this engine uh, was possibly used on a washing machine. Um, just a hunch. This is a very, so in terms of small engines, this is one of the smaller ones that Briggs made back then. Um, and just when is back then? Well, this guy over here was made back when men wore onions on their belts, 1937 or so. This engine is a little bit newer. Uh, this engine could have been made in as late as I think 1950 or so. Uh, this is, pro but we're gonna find out how old this engine is. On the flywheel, I'm hoping that there's a, a casting mark that has a year of production somewhere on it. So let's get this let's get this head off here. And wow, that's actually not terrible. Um, let's let's see what's going on. The engine could be out of time too. Although I, well, let's see. Yeah, the valves are moving just fine. And although 
seems to be a bit of a delay there. Well, maybe not. Huh. So that noise you hear, you hear that? That, that noise is the crankcase breather, I believe. Interesting. So I'll tell you what we don't have. We don't have any bent valves or nothing like that. The valves don't really look bad. A little bit of rust though. Here. Let me take my flashlight and take a look at the valve seat. And I'll report back my findings. Okay. Yeah. Alright, so this these valves need to be lapped. They need to be ground, they need to be lapped. And yeah, yeah, that's that's what it needs. A little bit of a little bit of grinding, a little bit of lapping, um, for sure, without a doubt. And that that is a that is a requirement. Uh, what I'm seeing is this engine sat with the intake valve open for a while, and there's a little bit of rust forming um, on the surface of the intake valve. It's not the end of the world. So what we got to do, and we're not going to do it in this video, we're just kind of doing some exploratory investigation here. We definitely need to take this engine down as far as pulling the valves out and get a good look at the valve seats and then lap, grind the valves. Um, that, that, that has to happen, uh, without a doubt. So let me pull this this out here. I did say that this and in this engine here, so big design change from 1937 to 19, you know, 40s. The crankcase breather on this motor is completely separate. It's a, it's its own it's its own thing. Kind of like David S. Pumpkins, it just sort of sits here. It's its own thing. Any questions? Uh, basically, it's just a ball of mesh soaked in oil and it serves as the crankcase breather and it is not a positive crankcase ventilator it's uh, air can come in and go out as it pleases and that's what it does on this engine the crankcase breather is a positive crankcase breather so it only allows air to go out rather than come in you can actually you can hear the valve open you can hear it Okay, what's happening is a spring-loaded valve is opening up just enough to allow any air that's built up in the crankcase as the piston comes down to escape, and that's all it does. This is a little bit, a little bit more environmentally friendly, I guess. Um, well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Uh, but it is a, it is a, um, it, it allows air out but not in. So it doesn't allow the crankcase to pressurize. I, I, I don't know why they changed the design, but it's cool. I mean, it works. Uh, it was basically, that is how all Briggs and Stratton crankcase breathers have worked since then, I believe. Um, so, all right. So that's what that noise is. And you'll hear that on a modern Briggs motor as well. Okay. I wanted to see if the valve guides are gummy. Or there's something gumming up the valve. So what I did is I open up the, the intake valve and I'm holding it with my fingers and I'm closing, turning the crank, it snaps shut. So maybe there is nothing wrong and it's all in my head. But no, I do believe that we do need to grind these valves for sure. This thing has that perfect old engine smell. Oh. This whole thing, it just smells like old grease. We're not going to restore this engine, but we will get it running. Um, what I don't want to do is I don't want to start stripping paint off. I'm, this engine is this engine is what they call perfectly patina. Original paint, original decals, original data plate. I mean, that is what you want to find. 
You're not gonna find an engine that's been sitting for 80 years and looks like this. Never gonna happen. Um, that's never been restored. You're just not gonna find one like that. An engine like this, however, this is a good find because again, it is all there. Except for the fuel tank, which is not a problem. And we just take a little bit of WD-40 and you can actually see all that beautiful paint still intact. Those beautiful logos still intact. And this engine is a, this, you don't restore this. If you're, if you're looking to find an old engine to rebuild, you don't want to, you can do the internal mechanical restoration. You can rebuild the carburetor, replace gaskets and seals, but don't go painting this because this is per, this is, this is what engine collectors want to see. Now, let's see if we can't determine an age of this motor. So we're going to just pop this uh, plywood cover off. Now, for those of you longtime viewers of my channel, you're probably pissed off that I'm doing all these engine videos. Um, I want to point something out. So I try to utilize the seasons to my advantage. Right now is the perfect season, like early fall, late summer, to work in my garage because there's an unheated garage. So it's absolutely perfect uh, weather for this kind of thing in the garage. Now, as we approach winter, well, the picture changes a little bit. Look at this, look at this stack of washers. It's like they took all the washers they had in their parts bin and just stuck them on there. So either that's the wrong bolt or Somebody really liked washers. Oh, it's two bolts. All right, look at this little bitty thing. Oh, it's so cute. All right, so you'll notice. So you'll notice a couple of things that are different from this engine to this one. Now this engine has a massive flywheel. This engine is rated for about, I want to say it's two to three horsepower. Actually says it right in this book here. This engine is rated for, does it say? Yes, it does. Apparently not. I thought it had the horsepower rating on it. But if I'm not mistaken, this engine has a rating of somewhere around the neighborhood of uh, two to three horsepower. And that's about it. Um, and you look at how, how massive and heavy it is. This thing, this thing weighs about as much as my lawnmower. Um, <laughs> complete lawnmower, if not more. And, uh, yeah. So with a full tank of gas, you're talking some serious heft, about two to three horsepower, maybe. And I don't know what the torque figures are on it, but it sounded, when I had it running a while back or yesterday, a while back, <laughs> when I had it running yesterday, it sounded pretty beefy. Um, like it wanted to pull something really big. So, um, anyway. This engine, on the other hand, this is rated for somewhere around half, these one and a half, or one half of a horsepower to uh, maybe two horsepower, maybe two. And you can see like, the size difference is, is incredible. But anyway, one thing I want to point out is how they relocated at this point, they had moved the magneto to the outer rim of the flywheel. And, um, but the points are still up inside there. So you still have to remove the flywheel to adjust, clean, replace, whatever the point. Um, so, oh, this is bad news. We're missing a fin. Uh-oh. That's bad news, guys. I don't know if we're going to use this flywheel. Um, let's see if we can find a date stamp. Not all Briggs flywheels have a date stamp on them, but it might be on the inside, which sucks. Ah, uh, yeah, it might be up inside there. I just, but we're missing a fin, so somebody, so this usually happens when somebody tries to remove the flywheel the wrong way. Um, <laughs> yeah, that happens uh, if they start, oh, 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 there's a two. I just noticed there's a two stamp. I think there's a, a double digit, maybe year somewhere. Two 
two, just two. And a Z, or is that an N? Yeah, I don't see a year. I guess the year guy was out that day, but the month guy was like, reporting for duty, sir. Um, so what happens, and <laughs> I'll admit I've done this when I was a younger man. I was a middle schooler, give me a break. Um, you take like a screwdriver and you just, with your ratchet and you're just, that's usually how that happens. Um, somebody's had this flywheel off and they cracked the fin off. The good news is it's a Model 5S and they're, they're actually a very inexpensive engine. These engines aren't really worth much. Um, I read somewhere they're worth like 50 bucks fully restored. So we're not going to go crazy with this thing anyway. But um, a flywheel shouldn't be too hard to find. If I'm going to put any effort into this motor, I'm going to replace that fin, or replace the flywheel. Um, a little bit of end play. Remember, when we did this engine over here, we used shims on the mag plate. Uh, well, on that one, it was a mag plate. On this one, it's a, a, a points cover. And the whole thing should come off as one assembly. Um, yeah, it's too bad there's no year stamp on it. So they give us a, a half a clue as to what the hell we're dealing with. But check out this early version of the what they what they call the pneumatic governor. Um, in later model years, it was a flag. It looked it looked just like a mailbox flag from the U.S. And it was curved around the flywheel. And it would, um, as the flywheel spun faster, the air coming off the flywheel would push it away, which would close the throttle down a bit um, to whatever the set point was. And this one is a little more ornate. Now this thing here, I didn't quite figure out what that was, but I'm going to tell you what I think it is. Now that I'm seeing this for the first time, all, all apart here. What do we got here? All right, I believe could be, does it have a lever that goes up inside there? Yes, it does. That could be our timing. That could be timing. Um, I should pull the manual up for this engine. It's either timing or, or, or static engine speed. So it might have at one point linked to this here. Yeah, it probably did. No, because uh, this is where your throttle goes. Yeah, I guess. Well, anyway, the first time I've ever looked at a 5S rather than, I mean, let alone worked on one. But we think this is a early 50s, maybe, or late 40s. It's hard to tell. Without that damn date stamp. But we did confirm that there was no spark from the ignition at all um, and that much we know and that is a white yeah this has got this this needs help this wire needs to be replaced um, it's well the reason being the boot is completely chewed to hell um, I never did check the oil level so maybe we do that what do I need for uh, tools here could be over here. I wonder if it's uh let me, let me get a wrench. But yeah, if I were to restore this engine, I could just as easily pick up a complete engine for the price of one component. The Model A, on the other hand, I mean these Model A's are worth a lot more. They're a lot harder to find, and if you have the um the air intake or even the air filter, um they're worth even more. So, uh, as of right now, it looks like to to replace the air intake assembly is going to cost me about two hundred and fifty dollars, which I'm not going to do. The engine will run without it, but if I'm, I'm going to keep my eyes open for one, and if I ever find one, that'll be cool. Um, did you guys notice something? This engine has no head gasket. Did you did you pick up on that? I just noticed it. There's no head gasket on this engine. 
So this thing didn't have a chance in hell of having compression at all. And maybe that was part of our problem. Here's what I think happened. I think somebody was working on this motor and they got it over their head and they just sort of bailed. Um, they misplaced some parts. They did this or did that. And we just sort of Christian bailed on it. So, um, I'm thinking that might be the case. I mean, nobody puts an engine back together without a, without a head gasket, except, well, I did that once um, when I was a kid. And I think it actually worked. It was on the lawnmower that I used to, uh, to mow people's lawns with. Well, that's what you use the lawnmower for. Oh, wait, 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 wait. This is, um, this is not, yeah, this is the, the base mounting bolt. This is not the oil. No, 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 no. It was slotted, so it kind of threw me off. Like, why would the engine mounting bolt be slotted? This is for the sump mount. But yeah, you need a head gasket to achieve optimal combustion gas sealing properties. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I gotta get a break. I got a seven eighths, but that's too big. That's for something else. Yeah. Let's see what kind of sludge lurks within. Oh, it's not a three quarter. Yeah, you've got your post-war engine and your pre-war engine right here. Um, big difference in, in construction quality. But then again, they're, they're totally different product lines anyway. All right. So first glance, looks like that oil is pretty clean. The, uh, yeah, that's, that's fresh oil, guys. <laughs> oh my God, that smells awful. Um, it's been there a long time, but... It's fresh oil. I mean, it smells like it's got some fuel contamination, but it also smells like it's been in there for a hundred years, or at least at least twenty years, maybe. So, and it's full. It's not empty. But yeah, an engine like this. I mean, this could have been used on a very small, uh, maybe a garden edger, a reel mower, like like a. Um, uh, like a, a, a real like as in not not like real as in ooh I'm a real boy no real as in j -j 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 -j, you know like they use on golf courses um, that is what the model A came off of I believe it was some kind of a piece of garden equipment that it was mounted on um, hence the green paint that was on it this engine um, we, what we don't know is if this was sold as a bare motor from Sears or if it was sold on a piece of Sears garden equipment. But I will say that this type of engine is actually quite commonly found on appliances such as washing machines. I had a viewer uh, ask about that actually. Um, like, why would they, why, I, I guess this, I don't know if this person was being facetious or what, but it's a good point, and I thought I should bring it up. In the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and into the 50s, electricity was not as ubiquitous as it is today. Electricity was still kind of a luxury and not available everywhere. Not everybody could afford it. And it was not always available in rural areas. So, what did Ma and Pa Kettle do for their household chores before electricity? Well, um, before there were electric washing machines, there were 
gas-powered washing machines. Maytag is, of course, one of the most famous. Maytag actually made their own engines. Um, the Maytag single and twin cylinder two-stroke engines are actually quite collectible. And if you're looking, if you ever want to get into the small engine or the antique engine collecting hobby, it is a great starting point. Um, these engines can be had often for a song, um, and they're not very difficult to get running again. But these engines were designed to power uh, the the the, um, the washing machines of the of the era, and you would have to you would load your clothes in, you'd start the engine, you load your clothes in, you fill it with water from the from the well or whatever. You, you you kick the, the engines would always almost always have kick starters on them and you you'd get out there you'd you'd kick start that engine did whatever it took to get it running the exhaust now if you had your 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 washing machine in the house the exhaust would be run out through the basement window with a flex hose and you can still buy these by the way you can still buy these flex hoses they're made out of metal anyway and you would run this engine. This engine would run on, you know, often white gas, like Coleman fuel or something. And it would um, it would wash your clothes. <laughs> you know, they didn't really realize that at some point gasoline would become, uh, you know, a, a, a valued commodity as it was back then. Um, although that's funny because I just filled up my SUV with a dollar eighty-eight a gallon gas can't figure that out right now but anyway so <laughs> I thought there was a shortage anyway so <clears throat> so you'd, you'd wash your clothes now some of these engines were designed uh, with water cooling jackets and what they would do is they would cleverly use the engines heat to heat the water so you would have a heated wash tub which is quite nice but some other manufacturers produced small engines like this one here um, for other washing machine manufacturers that didn't have Maytag stamped all over them. And uh, that is, an engine of this size would have been perfect for that application. Um, it was small, fairly efficient, easy to, easy to start, easy to pull. And um, they were very cheap, uh, very inexpensive engines back in their day. Although this is a four-stroke engine, which would have been a lot quieter, maybe, and a lot more reliable than your two-stroke washing machine engine. I just I can't fathom having a two-stroke washing machine in my house. I mean, I'm drooling at the thought, but I just couldn't imagine that. But anyway, so what are we going to do here? Um, so as of right now, I'm going to pop the head back on. We're going to put the bolts back where they go. Um, this engine needs far more work than I am willing to, <laughs> to dish out right now. I'd like to finish our Model A. Um, God, this engine is a solid... Look at this. Look at this. Look at my workbench. Like, just watch how much it flexes. Like, it is almost maxing out. I have it screwed to the bench with construction screws. And it is, like, maxing out the strength of that poor bench. I didn't build this bench. The previous owner did. And um, I would have built it a lot stronger. In fact, I think I might make some improvements to it, to be honest. It, it really needs it. Came with the house. You know, I, I'm not complaining. When I saw the garage for the first time, like, oh, cool, a bench. I can, I can do work in here. But anyway. <sighs> well, it's getting mighty late. Why don't we put this thing back together again? And if I come up with any ideas, I'll bring them up to you. But yeah, I mean, it's got its original data plate and everything. And it's never been repainted. But. Oh yeah, that goes over oh, the head. So this head, look at this head. Um, oh, wait a second. What's this? Huh. Well, well, there you go. I even have a part number on it. This is original, 291301. I bet this is the original head gasket. It was there. It just didn't look like it. Cast iron head. 
guess they realized that having aluminum heads and iron blocks is probably not a great idea. Not that, uh, or maybe it cost too much. More than likely it was a cost issue. But I'm saddened to hear that poor Briggs and Stratton is, uh, ooh, we have, we have numbers. Oh, notice that stupid Z logo and then the number two. I wonder if the two might be 42. No, 42 would be like right in the war era. Um, maybe, maybe 52. I'm going to have to get back on. See, if this was a Briggs and Stratton, um, like one sold by Briggs rather than by a, by Sears, um, we might have a bit better idea as to uh, well, what we don't have. What we don't have is a Briggs and Stratton serial number. We have a Sears serial number, which, yeah, kind of sucks. Oh wait, this was, was this over here or was it somewhere else? I think it was over here. Nope. No, I think it was here. Yeah, if we had a Briggs and Stratton serial number, we would be in, we'd be in the money. Because then we could narrow down the production year and That's not the original muffler. I'm sure you've all picked up on that by now. Uh, that muffler is so totally not original. Oh, I just realized something. Look at this. I just realized this. So this is not the original uh, cable. But furthermore, this may not even be the original Magneto. So they, they cut the rubber off of this so that you could shut it off. Um, that is not right for this engine at all. I, I'm sure you all knew that. I was just testing you. Okay. So. so the plan for the Model A, let's talk about the Model A. I, I like the Model A more than I like this one. Why? Because the engine has some sentimental value to me. It belonged to my grandfather and we don't know what his plans were for it. We will never know because he is six feet under. And, well, technically he's not. Technically, oh yeah, I guess they buried him. I'm trying to think, did, his, did we, we disperse his ashes or did we, we buried his ashes? Uh, anyway, not <laughs> to get too morbid here. But he's no longer with us, um, at least not in physical life form. Uh, but we don't know what his plans were with that motor. We don't know when he got it. We don't know why he had it. We don't know what, his, what he was... He was an engine collector, but he was more into the big engines. He had, um, as I mentioned earlier, he had, in another video, he had an International Harvester Model A, uh, uh, what was it? LA, it was an LA. He had two LAs and one LB. And, um, and unfortunately, I don't have the LA anymore. The LB, I think he sold it at some point. Or it was sitting at his old house and it got lost. It's a tragedy. The engine was in pieces and he was putting it together before he moved 24 years ago, I guess, at this point. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's really rather unfortunate that all of his engines have been kind of dispersed to other people. Um, but anyway, what are you going to do, right? So my plans for the um, Model A, let's see. I want to build a cart for it out of, out of oak. 
I'm going to try to find a, um, a wheel kit for the cart and a couple of blueprints or something. A couple ideas. So my plans for the Model A are as follows. What I want to do is build a custom engine cart for it. Um, that's that's going to happen for sure out of oak and um, you know nice clear coat finish and I'm going to get a, um, a set of wheels iron wheels and uh, that's what's going to happen with that yeah this uh, might be the towards the end of their use of hardware cloth but look at this shroud it's not even rusted it's in pretty good shape only two bolts hold it on they weren't fancy here. Look at that. Slide right on. I don't know what this washer salad is all about, so we're going to get rid of those, and we're going to use two split washers, and that's it. One on each bolt. And that's all we need. But somebody swapped out the coil on this motor with the wrong, well, I wouldn't say the wrong one, but it's not, it doesn't have the right, uh, the right wire, so we'll have to get another wire for it. Um, not a big deal. I know it's very expensive. And I'm going to go with the full reproduction wire, just as I did with the L um, LA. And we'll try to find a, a period correct spark plug for it, too. You know, just to keep it looking right. There you go. That's all we're going to do here. The unknown at this time of year Briggs & Stratton Model 5S. Um, fun fact, uh, when Apple was naming their phones, um, one of the engineers was an engine collector, and he thought it would be nice to pay homage to the Briggs & Stratton 5S engine. I, I think it's a very nice thing to do and um, really only a, few, only a handful of people will ever pick up on that. This bolt here, um, I don't know why it's made this way. I'm going to find out though. It's got a rubber, looks like a rubber seal on it maybe. long. Yeah, why Why do they do this? Why is it made like this? Let's find out. It's like really big. I'll show you in a minute. Oh, it's, oh, it's an oil fill. It's got a, um, it's got two giant washers. Got it. That oil, oh my, if you've ever been to an antique engine show, like where everybody brings their old iron and fires it up, steam, gas, all that shit, this oil smells like the air of an antique engine show. It's a, it's a heavenly aroma. But this gives us a nice little peek into the crankcase. Um, I'm not sure if this was meant to be the oil fill or what, but it's also, interestingly, here, check this out. It's the mounting bolt for the engine base. You can see that oil, it's nice and green. We're gonna leave it in there for now. I'm not gonna go nuts trying to change it, but it's like it's a major structural bolt. I don't know why they would use it as an oil fill. If any, I should just, you know what I should do is look at the manual. Um, Briggs & Stratton still has the manuals for these motors on their website, believe it or not. That's like when for the last couple well, a couple of years ago, you can still get drivers for your compact PCs from the 80s on HP's website. Um, I don't think they do that anymore, though. I think those days are over. But Briggs & Stratton, despite all the turmoil they're going through, they will still, they will still let you download. But get this. They have the manuals, right? You can download them in PDF format. But look at this. That's not 1930s. 
it's like they, their lawyers have forced them to insert these forms into the manual regardless of how old the engine is. I'm just picturing the kinds of people who would download this manual are either wackos like myself or old grizzled bearded men with, you know, a couple strands of white. I'm talking like um, David Crosby looking dudes. You know, with a cigar in their mouth and a Schlitz can of Schlitz beer in the other. Let's see. Uh, oh no, I guess I need to be aware of the gasoline. I mean, they're gonna like they're gonna learn something from this. Oh, I shouldn't put my fingers in the blades. I don't know how. Anyway, sorry. If you are a David Crosby look-alike with a cigar and a can of Schlitz in one hand. Um, just um, try not to be offended by my comments. Well, and David, David Crosby's a great musician. I don't want to trash him. Gee. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's gonna conclude our video. This has been fun. I'm having more fun with these engines than I've had with computers in a long time. See, all day I get to play with computers. And I don't really like to do that. I mean, it pays the bills, but, you know, I don't want to do it for fun. This is fun. Ciao.